Welcome to Country acknowledges our First Peoples, the custodians who continue their stewardship across our vast lands. We invite you to be our guests and make a true connection. Welcome to the Yorokan. Nanga. Katmon. Yanda ne goda da goda. Welcome to Kupri Wara Kasmigas. You're now in that. Come on there. Momanjika. Welcome guys, my name is Dasha Maloney. Full call to welcome you. Not more. Welcome. Yalla da jaun gura. Gare da. Ba kubri waro bubu. Kuyu kuyu. Koji ego. Not more. Woman indi. Well, thanks for joining us on welcometocountry.com. We're really excited. We're in conversation with an amazing First Nations woman who needs no introduction, but I have to say personally, she's had a great influence in my life. Um, Marcia Langton, of course, is joining us. Marcia, thank you so much for coming to us from Melbourne. How's lockdown been? Uh, impossible to describe easily. Rhoda. Uh, we spent 123 days in lockdown, um, but with extraordinary outcomes. I think we're up to day 14 with no positive cases in Victoria reported. So uh, I, I think I, I, I'm actually uh, proud to live on Narm in Melbourne, um, where most Melburnians have uh, been abiding by the pandemic restrictions for the good of all. Indeed, there's a couple of places that you have very long and strong connections, but I'd love to just go back to good old South Central Queensland. So your heritage is that of uh, Bidjara and Yemen? Yes. So uh, let me show you one of my favourite photos taken by one of my cousins. Uh, I'll just get it open for you because, uh, you know, one of the things that visitors don't know about um, Australia is, uh, and indeed people who live in, Australians who live in cities don't know, is that uh, we have big skies. We certainly do and we have great and light. And, and so if you are out on country, um, away from the cities, one of the amazing um, experiences is to see the big sky. Country really embodies us, I guess. And when you talk about, you're a big sky person and you grew up under those massive Queensland skies. I can only imagine what you must have seen as a child looking up to the stars. And of course, as we often say, we're the first astronomers. Yes. Um, I'm trying to get a photo up to show you one of the big skies. From you know what my we could country. do? We could... Wow, absolutely beautiful. Um, and you know, that's early in the morning um, and it's taken by my cousin, Alan Parsons, who's a wonderful photographer. He, he uh, is identified more with the Bidjara side of our family than I am. Um, I actually grew up in South Southwest Queensland uh, for much of my childhood. Um, and this is the kind of scrub that, you know, or what we call scrub, mm. uh, that, you know, I feel is very much part of me. Uh, my cousin Alan was trying to take photos of the finches. Um, oh. Yeah. So he called this photo Carnarvon Gorge and Finches. So Carnarvon Gorge is one of the very sacred places in, in Bidjara country. Um, of course, that bird life is all about um, those finches going to water and things like that. Your grandmother, Ruby, 
had such an influence, I think, like most of our grandmothers in your life. And just knowing your daughter and her being called Ruby, it makes me think of how often in our communities we name our children after our grandparents and that name almost continues as if they're with us. Was there an intention when you named Ruby? Yes, indeed. I named her after my grandmother, Ruby Waddy. I didn't grow up on a mission. The places where I lived were called um, native camps. They were, uh, you know, regulated by the government, but it, but with a much lighter touch than in the actual missions. Um, Is that where you get your strength from, that maternal presence in your life from a very young age because I imagine your grandma Ruby would have had to be a pretty strong individual in that period of time. She uh, grew up with a family. Uh, she had a sister, Teresa, my, my, my aunt, great aunt who I, I knew very well and loved very much. Um, and she, they and their parents had what was called back in the old days an outfit. So they had a dray and horses and working dogs. And they um, <clears throat> they travelled from um, you know station to station and provided services uh, to stations, um, you know, to the drovers, uh, you know, to to the musters. Um, and, and so on. And as an adult, my grandmother became uh, a station cook. And all, all through my childhood, um, it was, you know, what we looked forward to each year was seeing her at Christmas time and, and often at Easter time as well, when she'd get her holidays and come down from the stations, often bringing with her, you know, some, some meat packed in a box, um, some lamb or, you know, a ham. And, and I would ask her questions about life on the stations. She was such an amazing person and so strong. She lived till she was 96. And, uh, and in her final years, uh, she actually uh, lived with me in Brisbane. I was very close to her and uh, I loved her very much. So one of the things that I find uh, interesting about having, you know, a grandmother who worked on the stations in Queensland is that I feel very connected uh, to those places where she worked. And while she was alive and after she passed, I went back to many of those places trying to find, uh, you know, the places of the stories that she told me. Uh, she had a way of telling the most incredible stories but I hear you telling those stories, Marcia, and then I think of you, you know, you're at Queensland University, you go to the ANU and you study um, anthropology um, and you come from this really strong foundation, I guess, of matriarchs. Do you think when you first went into entered university, and particularly in Queensland, I can't even imagine uh, the challenges that would have faced you? Well, it was a horrible experience in 1969. In fact, I had to leave. I didn't finish my degree until I came, I went overseas. When mm. I came back, Eventually, I went to the Australian National University and finished my undergraduate degree there. I got first class honours in 1984. And then I went to work at the Central Land Council for seven years. And then afterwards, I did my PhD through Macquarie University. And um, uh, got a PhD awarded in 2005 on, on Aboriginal land tenure. So Just incredible. Yeah. Um, that was really trailblazing, you know. I mean, you were doing subjects that there weren't possibly any other First Nations peoples in your uh, tutorials, I would imagine. Um, not back in 1969, but when I got to the ANU, uh, 
there was one other student in my first year and then gradually and years later, more students came. In fact, one of the students uh, who studied with me was Stan Grant. Oh my gosh. Yes, he was a, a youngster at that time. I, I went to the ANU as a mature age student. I, I was in my twenties, but he was about 18. Um, and, you know, there were quite a few people in our cohort and went on to become great achievers. Well, a great achiever you are, but I want to just touch on, you know, you did travel overseas for a period of time and it was great change was happening in Australia during that time, I guess that decade you were away. But what really astounds me, and of course you're a mother traveling, quite young, you've got your young child with you. And that travel across Asia, because I often say now, and particularly when we're looking at cultural tourism and everything, I go, oh, you don't need to go on about Buddha. We have our own religion and extraordinary, um, you know, spirituality in this country. But at that period of time, I think you were incredibly brave. I don't know how you did it with a young child. But can you tell us just some of those moments when you were in Asia and actually looking at Buddhism? Well, I, I, I met Buddhist monks in my travels because, you know, Buddhist monks travel. Um, and uh, they're wonderful company because they, you know, they're so calming. In fact, I was in Bangkok just, you know, a few years ago on one of the ferries on the Chow Prior. And the, the river gets very choppy when there's a lot of river traffic. And so the ferry was, you know, swaying backwards and forwards and everybody like me was hanging on to something um, because of the swaying of the boat. But there was a Buddhist monk standing in the middle of the ferry, very still, not holding on to anything. And he remained absolutely stable. And he was showing us how you could, you know, just center yourself um, and sway along with the boat and, and not be frightened. It was, you know, so you always have these wonderful experiences around the, the monks who are traveling, uh, you know, through the cities, through the countryside, uh, because twice a day they collect arms, but they also um, go on pilgrimages and travel from temple to temple, often walking or catching buses. So I ended up sitting next to a monk on a bus in Taiwan um, in about 1970 or 71, um, and Taiwan, as you know, has a very steep mountain range. And so the roads were, you know, a series of hairpin bends down very steep cliffs. And while everybody on the bus was screaming, the monk was laughing and telling me stories. So <laughs> monks can be very good company in frightening situations. And of course, this is a, uh, a characteristic of our elders, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, you find these great similarities between our culture and Asian cultures. There are enormous similarities. People seem to think that, the, you know, that our differences are insurmountable. But there are extraordinary similarities. You know, throughout Asia, you find sacred trees, just like in Australia. And, and they're treasured. Um, and they hold, the, you know, the spirits of the ancestors, just like here. So, so many similarities. So, you know... Um, I don't find Asia a foreign place at all. I no. regard many of the countries in Asia as, you know, places where I feel very much at home. This is a part he of my grandfather. He's a mate. Wow, what a strong face. Yeah, that's my grandfather, Fred Waddy. Good head of hair too. Yeah, you can see he's getting on there. <coughs> he but was yeah. an Iman man and he had a twin brother. Ted Waddy, um, and uh, he, uh, he was an amazing person. He kind of, uh, I didn't know him very well as a child, uh, but, but he was a traveler. But, but once I uh, was coming down a, uh, a, uh, an escalator in a fancy hotel in Brisbane and the uh, there were some 
people from Cape York, some elders from Cape York, and they saw me coming down and uh, one of them said to me, uh, you waddy. I said, yes, how did you know? Oh. He said, you look just like uh, Fred Waddy and, and he had worked on the railways with my grandfather. So uh, wherever I traveled in, you know, remote Queensland, there were people who knew my grandfather. So, uh, and had worked with him on the railways. Um, so uh, he and his twin brother have, were taken in as, uh, I believe as orphans to uh, the Bandala mission or the Tarum mission, which was uh, the subject of the forced march to Warabinda in the 1920s. That's and then true. they went out to work on the stations. But grandfather also worked on the railways and also built bridges um, and buildings. Uh, if you see the old stone bridges in Toowoomba, most of them were built by Aboriginal labour and my grandfather was one of them. And he was also a victim of, you know, the whole stolen wages um, problem. Uh, so, you know, I, I come from, you know, two lines of very strong people who knew the bush well. Um, grandfather and Ted also rode horses, of course. And because they were quite small, they were um, famously jockeys in the country, races in their youth. Yeah. Can you remember the first time you went to Gugla or um, um, to Gumich lands? Did you, do you remember that very first time and what you felt? Oh, yes. So I first went there uh, when I was working for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in 1989. Uh, my job was to uh, find out from people in the communities what they believed were the underlying issues in the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And I met with a very great elder long since past um, the late Daimbalupu Munungur. And uh, I was taken by uh, a wonderful Aboriginal woman to meet him. And she gave me uh, instructions on how I should present myself to him. And it was, uh, you know, I was told to um, sit down, sit below his head, uh, explain who I was, what I was doing there. Um, so I, he was sitting on a chair and I thought, well, the only way I can do this is to sit on the ground. So we both sat in, on the ground in front of him and we had a wonderful conversation with him. Um, and that was my first experience of Yolngu protocol, how to present myself to a very important elder. Um, and he, of course, was so generous in explaining what he felt was going on. And that was all reported in our report to the Royal Commission too much sorry business. Um, but of course, I'd known Gulleroy for quite a number of years before that. I met Gulleroy back in the 70s and we'd been good mates. Whenever he came to the city, uh, we'd, you know, we'd catch up and uh, uh, we talked about land rights. We talked about uranium mining, um, which he was battling back then. And uh, later, um, I, I moved to the Northern Territory to live. I lived in Alice Springs for seven years and I got to know Gulleroy um, because Gulleroy was the chairman of the Northern Land Council and, and uh, I, I served at the Central Land Council under two chairmen um, and uh, our councils collaborated frequently. So I got to attend meetings with Gulleroy in, in that capacity. But later I, I moved to Darwin and I worked at the old Northern Territory University and connected again with uh, Gulleroy and his family. And I worked very closely with his younger brother, the late Mandawoi Unipingu. And together we set up the, uh, uh, the Gama Festival. So it was Mandawoi's vision to establish the Gama Institute and the Gama Festival. And I went to the very first experimental Gama Festival. I took students and staff from the Northern Territory University we put up uh, old army tents, um, you know, and established our camp there at uh, at Gulkala. Um, and 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 we um, started the seminar series, 
on, you know, Indigenous knowledge alongside the ceremonial and cultural content of the festival that Mundawa and his family uh, curated. So uh, I've been to every Gama festival bar three, and of course we couldn't have one this year because of the pandemic, and, and played a role in developing the Gama festival, and um, but also working with Yolngu people on a variety of projects over the years. So yeah, I've been friends with Yolngu people for 40 years. And just for our listeners, if you're wondering, of course, we're referring to the Yudupingu family and um, Garma is held each year, usually around July in northeast Arnhem Land. And for many, many Australians, it's often their very first uh, connection with Aboriginal culture. But you immerse yourself at this festival. You're really welcomed. Um, and I guess there you ride on country. It is quite an extraordinary experience. But the Garma Festival has led to many things that have occurred with capacity building of the local community. The local community is very involved. And Marcia, of course, we're speaking with Marcia Langton, Professor Marcia Langton, and um, her book, Welcome to Country, is available on our website. And just touching on that, Marcia, when you talked about the generosity but also those cultural nuances that you have to observe um, that you learn from in community. Um, for example, sitting below the speaker's head and things like that. You can learn so much by just reading this book, Welcome to Country, because like those leaders and custodians, Marcia, you're passing it on, I guess, through a newer technology as being in a printed and digital form but your generosity is quite astounding because you're helping people unpack what is the complexity of Aboriginal Australia. Well, this is the book, Welcome to Country, A Travel Guide to Indigenous Australia, with a foreword by Stan Grant. It won the Illustrated Nonfiction Prize uh, in 2019 from the Australian Independent Booksellers Association. And it is beautifully illustrated. And it's uh, in two parts with an introduction by me and then uh, entries by states and territories on places that you can uh, visit, uh, curated by Hardy Grant staff with the expert assistance of Nina Fitzgerald and Amber Rose Atkinson. Um, and yes, it's designed to not only introduce international visitors, to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experiences um, uh, for visitors, but for all Australians. And there's so much that Australians don't learn about living in their own country and, and the First Nations histories and cultures that, um, you know, when, when Hardy Grant came and asked me to work on this book with them, I jumped at the chance because it's been such a hard slog as a university lecturer and with my engagement with schools to get Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge into our curricula. Well, um, your second edition actually is aimed at the, uh, the exactly school. Exactly that. Uh, yeah. So the success of the travel guide led to this. So Hardy Grant asked me to write the book for young Australians. And so this book can be read by teachers and students. And, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased with the success of these books because uh, I think all Australians ought to know the truth about where they live. Oh, my gosh. All the leaders across the country that you've known personally or been involved with, just some of the very early pioneering work into land rights. And one of those people, of course is uh, Mr. Pat Dodson that you worked with. But you two actually, I think people need to know this other claim to fame was 250 odd years ago, of course, Ben Along went and met the queen or the king at that time. Um, and you and Mr. Dodson actually went to meet the queen as well. I think you were the, the only, the first in that period of time. Am I right there? And if so, and why did you go? Well, uh, now Senator Pat Dodson um, was back then when we uh, 
went as a delegation to meet with the Queen during the first Republican debate. Uh, we had we had worked together at the Central Land Council for a long time. Pat Dodson was the uh, director of the Central Land Council, and uh, you know, through the land rights network, had established an enormous uh, camaraderie with with people around the country. So the delegation was uh, certainly inspired by. Pat and uh, the, I'll tell you who the rest of the group were, the wonderful Lewitcher O'Donoghue, uh, the late uh, Garchel Jerker, uh, Peter Yu, uh. um, and uh, look, I, I won't go through all the names, but it was a very interesting, oh, yeah. very interesting delegation. And um, yes, we were the first official delegation to meet with the Queen since, since Benelong. And, and we went in the middle of the Republican debate because you, you, you'll remember that in the first Republican debate, the issues of First Australians, of what how we say it now, First Nations people, were not really considered. And so Republicans wanted to turn Australia into a republic with no acknowledgement of us. They did certainly invite uh, Pat O'Shane and Lewitcher and and Garchel to participate in their convention, but there were no other Indigenous people. So we were headed down a path like the first constitutional conventions back in the 19th century, which resulted in a racist constitution, of being excluded again. And what we were very worried about that. So we wanted to say to the Queen, um, King George III was sent to Australia with instructions to, um, to treat with the local people in peace and friendship. And you can read his instructions to Captain mm. Cook, for instance. Uh, and of course, that never eventuated. The, the outcomes were the reverse. One of the most horrible histories of colonization on the, on the planet. Uh, which the Republicans were oblivious to. And there was a great, very great fear, as you'll remember, uh, that one of the propositions was an elected president. And at that time, with the rapid rise in popularity of Pauline Hanson, it was highly likely that she would be elected as our first president. So we had to do something because Australia was headed down the path of being an isolated white racist nation cutting itself off from the Commonwealth of Nations, um, disrespectful of human rights and the United Nations community, um, and Republicans, you know, hurling themselves into a white racist future. That's why we met with the Queen, um, because we wanted to re-establish the grounds for our recognition. Now, we couldn't talk about it at the time because, and I still can't talk about the details of the meeting because uh, it's against protocol. But subsequently, of course, the Queen and other members of the royal family now make it a, a very much important part of their tours to Australia to meet with traditional owners. Of course, the Queen always had. And one of the gifts that Patrick Dodson gave to the Queen was a photograph of his own grandfather meeting with the Queen when she visited Broome in the 1950s. And both of them were standing by one of those old cattle trucks. Um, and, uh, but the, the royal family uh, accelerated the significance of their meetings with traditional owners and, and elders when they came to Australia. And you will have noticed that, um, you know, the support of the royal family for the recognition of of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their observance of protocol in meeting with our people properly, um, you know, really changed the debate. So our visit to the Queen and her very welcome, warm welcome to us um, did change the debate. The Prime Minister at the time was John Howard. And uh, 
our visit took the wind out of the sails of that rise of white nationalism at the time. Um, and subsequently, of course, Gulleroy uh, raised with uh, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard the importance of constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I was a part of that delegation and it, it was an extraordinary experience. And an incredible delegation. I think, you know, you touched on something there about the monarchy is not so much about our opinions on the monarchy, but the issue of protocol yet again. I mean, you know, you talk to a lot of people out in community and they understand that she is in service to her people in a way and how the monarchy operates. And then when you look at our custodians, our leaders, people like yourself, Marcia, we see that you're in service, you, you're like in the, you know, the boss people that in service, the obligation to community and continuing those sorts of ensuring that that dialogues increase. So um, it's quite interesting, that whole structure of protocol and how it leads to so many different other things. That's right. And uh, I think that's what elders recognise in the royal family, uh, you know, the sense of tradition and protocol. Um, mm. And that's why so many Aboriginal elders are very welcoming of the royal family um because of respect for tradition and protocol it's the these are tradition and protocol are the glue that bind us together and and make our lives worthwhile and enjoyable and keep conflict at bay i uh, and and absolutely and look i have to say Mar marcia thank you so much for just sharing these little small snippets and insights into not only your life, but some of the early work that was done and what we're seeing reflected in these books now, where there's no excuse actually to not understand, but you've enabled so many of us, whether you're First Nations or Australian, you have enabled virtually everyone to have the opportunity to read and unpack and try and get a, a, a much more uh, positive insight into cultural matters, but indeed cultural tourism and having experiences with our people across the country. So I really want to thank you so much for joining us. And I, I apologise, actually, Marcia. I introduce you as Professor Marcia Langton, but of course, you also have an Order of Australia. You got that for... Um, service for anthropo what what was that actual order for uh well i i'm ao now I'm, I'm an officer of the order of australia but i was awarded the am back in 1993 for service oh, i didn't know you could get it twice oh there are a number of awards yeah so uh, i was a member of the general order of the um uh order of australia uh, from 1993 for advocacy for aboriginal rights and uh, services to anthropology and the AO was for services to education and advocacy of Aboriginal rights. So, um, yeah, I, I have been an educator for decades and that's uh, my contribution to Australians, writing books, teaching. But most of all, I hope, like you and uh, in the Welcome to Country group, um, giving other Australians a genuine and authentic experience of the country that they live in, knowing about First Nations people is fundamental uh, to being a modern Australian, I believe. So uh, I, I look forward to us working together in partnership. Thank you so much, Professor Marcia Langton AO, something we have in common. This is Rhoda Roberts AO. I'm a widgeable woman and I just wanna say, I hope you can tune in more for our discussions as we bring them to you on this digital platform. But Marcia, very much heartfelt thanks. You are an extraordinary woman and I don't think you realise how many of us young blackfellas that you have really guided and made us rethink and reposition some of our opinions. And I truly thank you because 
You are that knowledge woman that continues to ensure that those traditions will carry on into the future. So a very much a heartfelt thanks for being with us. Thanks, Rhoda. You're a star too, you know, and very inspirational. Oh. Welcome to Country acknowledges our First Peoples, the custodians who continue their stewardship across our vast lands. We invite you to be our guests and make a true connection. Welcome to Country is a non-profit organisation. It's at the helm of an Aboriginal man and it's run by Aboriginal staff. All Australians should be passionate about our own country and Aboriginal culture is a key part of that. We are the original storytellers and if everyone understands that message, I think that we'll have a far better future for all of Australia. It's about learning and connecting. As we know, it's the oldest living culture in the world. Simply is the premier site to find amazing experiences and great products around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. We've got to have a great website. So what was needed was to have a, a common platform that could do the marketing, the sales, all those things that small businesses, whether they're Indigenous or not, struggle over so people can focus on the thing they're passionate about and deliver that business. It's about creating employment and economic opportunities for the community. That's the number one thing. The best thing is by purchasing from us, they are directly giving back and supporting our Indigenous communities, artists and their families. The key is to enable them to stay on their country or in their city and be able to give them a platform to really flourish and create self-sufficiency. It is basically self-determination and learning about country through the narrative of our lens. We're not doing this because we want to put money into our pockets, but rather we want to see community benefit from what we're doing. We want to be able to show that we're in control and managing our, our stories. We want to be able to share those stories and we want to be able to create our own jobs and create our own economies. For me and my wife's business, uh, we've got the daughters all working. Uh, when we started, we had the, uh, and the brothers involved, we had the aunties involved, we had the uncles involved. Yeah, so we, we show them what Paraka look like and, then, and, then, and get them to throw a spear also as well. We're rich in culture and history, and I said we need to share that because that's where we're going to get changes. It's a great initiative, you know, really connecting with uh, Indigenous tourism, grassroots people, teaching culture and uh, educating people. This is a form of livelihood, it's independence, it's self-esteem, and it brings pride. Now that I've been here working for Trips over the last two years, I've actually became a master reef guard. You know, some of us are really reaping the benefits of that in terms of employment, you know, self-empowerment, uh, you know, self-sustainability, uh, economic development in our communities. It is really time that this country started to embrace the importance, the knowledge, the power and the beauty of Aboriginal culture. I have always wanted the non-Indigenous people in this country to actually experience meat and connect with Aboriginal people. When you visit a destination, you hear that local story, you feel the seasons, you witness the passion that people have on the land that has been there since time immemorial. There's nothing quite like it. Any time any Australian is looking for an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander cultural experience, the first thing they'll think of is welcome to country.com. To continue your journey and make a true connection right across Australia, visit us at welcome to